Hi everyone, and welcome to another CourseMed MRI video. Today we're going to do cardiac again. We're going to do cardiac viability and myocardial infarction. And this is part two in a two-part video. So if you haven't watched the first video, start with that. But if you have watched this one, we're going to look at tissue characterization today. So let's move to the simulator and let's go. So here we are back in the CourseMed simulator with our cardiac viability patient. In part one, we completed all our function and morphology sequences. We saw how to capture the heart's pumping action with our CNE images and how to check for structural abnormalities with our black and bright blood sequences. In this part two, we continue with a core part of a viability assessment, tissue characterization. This is where we answer the key clinical question what parts of the damaged heart can still recover. This is very important because it determines whether we treat aggressively or consider a transplant. More specifically, we are looking for three categories of myocardial health conditions. First are perfusion defects, such as coronary artery disease, stress-induced ischemia, and infarct-related issues. These show up best on a Sachs perfusion gradient echo sequence which shows first pass contrast through the myocardium. Ischemic areas appear dark on this sequence, and it's helpful for both stress and rest assessments. Next, we have acute myocardial injury conditions. This includes microvascular obstruction, acute infarction, and acute coronary syndrome. These early damages show up well on early LGE sequences. You'll see dark spots where there's microvascular obstruction, which is tissue that has just been injured, but not yet been scarred. Finally, we look for chronic myocardial damage. This includes myocardial infarction, transmural scars, and thrombi. Such late stage damages are best seen with late gadolinium enhancement sequences. These null the signal from healthy tissues so that scars appear bright, which shows us exactly how large and deep the damage is. And this information is critical to determine if revascularization will work. Now, when we do cardiac tissue characterization, there are two main approaches, with or without contrast. Without contrast, we use mapping sequences like T1, T2, or T2 star. We might also run phase contrast to check flow between chambers. But that's not what we're covering today. Today's focus is contrast-enhanced tissue characterization. So how is this protocol performed? We will first give the patient a bolus injection of Doterem or Gadovist. Then we will run three types of sequences using this single contrast injection. First, perfusion sequences, immediately as contrast arrives to see blood flow. Second, early enhancement sequences, at two to four minutes after contrast to see acute injuries. And finally, late enhancement sequences at 10 to 15 minutes after contrast to see scar tissue. But before any of this, we must always check if the patient can handle a contrast injection. Their EGFR needs to be above 35, but check your hospital's specific cutoff. If their kidneys can't handle it, we should either do tissue characterization without contrast or end the exam. This full contrast protocol takes about 20 minutes in total. The patient will need to hold their breath multiple times. So for sick patients, make sure to take breaks between sequences. Now, let's start with perfusion imaging, the first of our three contrast techniques. The perfusion technique tracks the contrast as it flows through the heart. So I'll find the sequence here and add it with position. This sequence will capture three short axis slices, basal, mid, and apical, to see the entire left ventricle from base to tip. For this viability study, we're only doing rest perfusion, no stress drugs like adenosine. We just want to see dead tissue, not test for blockages. However, right after perfusion finishes, we must have our early enhancement sequences already set up. These early sequences show microvascular obstruction, or MVO, 
These are areas where contrast can't penetrate due to severe damage. So I'll take these early gadolinium sequences over here and add them with position so we have them ready to go. I'll name them as early so we can distinguish them from the late enhancement sequences we'll do later. We will do early enhancement in three views, four chamber, two chamber, and three chamber. We will set the TI, the inversion time, to maximum. This creates a bright blood pool that highlights dark MVO areas. So I'll clone this sequence and rename this as my three chamber. Next, I'll add a TI scout, a test sequence that finds the exact timing to make normal heart muscle black. This means that only scars will show up as bright on our late enhancement sequences. Here we have it, and I'll add it with position. Finally, I'll add the late gadolinium enhancement sequences. I will add the two chamber and four chamber views here. The three chamber view was missing from our sequence list. So I'll clone this and make sure we also do the three chamber. Before you launch the perfusion, you should have all these sequences planned and ready to go. Because when you administer the contrast injection, you need to check that the patient is handling the injection well. So the more we prepare before the injection, the better. Now, let's start planning our perfusion sequence. We'll use the long axis view to guide us. Since this is a rest perfusion, we don't need to worry about the systolic phase. The trigger will still be end diastolic. In the axial view, we want to be perpendicular to the left ventricle wall. We typically use 60 phases for a healthy patient. That's 60 time points capturing the contrast as it flows through. But if the heart's not pumping well, where you can see it moving slowly on the scene, you'll need more phases to catch the full cardiac cycle. The phases are usually in the sequence tab. Mine's locked at 32 right now but that's still enough to cover one heartbeat. So I will save and run this pulse. In real life, we will first acquire 8 or 10 baseline images before any contrast arrives. Then we hit the injector and capture another 45 to 50 faces as the contrast washes through. And if the heart is really struggling, we add more faces. Now, let's move on to our early enhancement sequences. For the two-chamber view, I'll go ahead and copy all slices from my previous CNE two-chamber that we ran in part one of this video. Then, I'll make sure these sequences simulate early gadolinium. Early gadolinium appears three or four minutes after contrast injection. It also needs a very high TI, like 440, to show microvascular obstructions. I'll repeat the same process for the four-chamber. It's very important to copy the image position from what you've done before so that we can compare the images using the same slice planning. Then I'll change our inversion time. Finally, I will do the same thing again for our three chamber view. So once again, I will copy the slice position from our previous Cena sequence. I'll then set the inversion time to 440 and time after contrast to four minutes. We can now save and run this pulse. As you can see here, we've just gotten our perfusion image and we can already see a defect coming up in the apical part here. We'll look more closely at this defect later on. Right now, let's move on and set up the TI Scout. To plan the TI Scout, it's a good practice to copy its position from your Cine slices. So I'll scroll through the slices and pick one in the middle. Alternatively, I can right click on the sequence down here and select Copy Center Slice. Then I'll center our slice package here. Now let's save and run our early four chamber sequence. While that's running, I'll get the late enhancement sequences going. 
For all these post contrast sequences, we simply copy the positions from earlier sequences and then adjust the TI for each one. But first, let's run these early sequences. Before we set the inversion time for our late sequences, we want to check what value the TI Scout recommends to null the healthy myocardium. This will make the healthy tissue appear black so we can see any scars clearly. Now, let's look at our early gadolinium images that have just come out. In a healthy patient, both the myocardium and blood pool should be bright. Any black spots indicate microvascular obstruction where contrast can't get in. The earlier you scan after perfusion, the brighter the myocardium will appear. But waiting just two to three minutes should be enough to see MVO clearly. Give it more time if you're doing a manual injection, maybe three to four minutes, since pushing by hand is slower than the power injector. While we are waiting for the TI scout, I'll copy the slice positions for my late two chamber and four chamber sequences. I'll clone the four chamber to add our three chamber view as well. I'll copy its slice position from our previous three chamber and make sure to rename it as three chamber. And finally, let's copy the slice position for our short axis as well. Let's look at our TI, shall we? I'll go to the image viewer where we have better tools for visualizing it. Let's scroll through the images to find the right view we need. We want to watch this point over here particularly. This is where the myocardium interfaces with the blood pool. We also need to watch where the papillary muscles and the epicardium cross over. So if you look over here while scrolling the images, we can see that the myocardium starts to get black. Then it goes back to being light. We want a view that lets us see the epicardium as well. The epicardium should be bright, or at least a little brighter, but not too much. So the best image in our case is this one. Or at the latest, we could use this one. We can look at other muscles like this one, which should stay bright as we scroll through our images. But importantly, we want to see the myocardium that is black. The epicardium should be slightly brighter. So this is the epicardium, the bright trim around the dark donut. And here we have the blood pool, which will always have a very bright signal intensity. Let's now return to our sequences. These late gadolinium sequences are pretty much set up because it's still the same case. So let's run all these sequences. While this runs, we can start reviewing our images. Let's open our image viewer again and go through what we've acquired. Let's start with our perfusion images. I want to look at the perfusion defect that corresponds with the scar, as you can see here. You should watch the perfusion video as many times as you need to understand the contrast pathway, how the contrast travels through the heart. It goes from the right side to the left side, not the opposite. This may seem obvious, but it's really important to understand this pathway to time your sequences after contrast. Here's where we have our perfusion defect. Now we can determine if the scar is transmural or subendocardial. Subendocardial means that only the inner layer of myocardium is dead. These scars involve less than 50% of the wall thickness, so there's still viable tissue that might recover. Transmural scars means that the entire wall thickness is dead tissue with no viable myocardium left. You can think of it like toast. Subendocardial is burnt on one side only, while transmural is burnt all the way through. In this case, it's subendocardial, because the scar only goes up to a certain point. There's still part of the myocardium that's viable or recoverable. This second ROI over here. While this part over here is more likely a transmural scar. Then we have our late gadolinium enhancement, which lets us see our scar properly. 
As you can see here, it's partly transmural and partly subendocardial. So this means the whole ventricle will be studied and divided into 16 sections, plus one for the apical cap, according to the AHA standard model. The doctors will determine how much myocardium we can actually save and how much is lost to scar. This helps them determine if it's worth to do procedures like bypass surgery or stents. They'll also help the patient understand the risk for future heart attacks or worsening coronary artery disease. That's why it's so important to perform this protocol right. The doctors rely on our images to decide whether surgery can help or if it's too late to save the scarred areas of the heart. With that, we have completed the full cardiac viability study. Let's recap with the most important takeaways for this study. First, timing is everything when doing contrast-enhanced cardiac MRI. We capture three different phases from a single contrast injection, where each phase shows different types of heart damage. Perfusion imaging happens immediately as contrast arrives. This shows blood flow problems and ischemic areas. Early enhancement occurs two to four minutes after contrast and reveals microvascular obstruction, which is fresh damage that hasn't yet scarred. And finally, late enhancement happens 10 to 15 minutes after contrast, which highlights permanent scar tissue that appears bright against dark, healthy muscle. Second, we use gradient echo sequences with specific TI values for each phase. For perfusion, we use gradient echo without inversion to track contrast flow through three short axis slices. Early enhancement needs very high TI values, around 440 milliseconds. This makes both blood and healthy tissue bright, so dark MVO spots stand out. Late enhancement requires precise TI values from the TI scout, typically 200 to 250 milliseconds. This nulls healthy muscle to black and makes scars appear bright white. Third. Make sure to avoid these five common mistakes that may happen in a contrast-enhanced cardiac MRI. First, wrong TI selection. Always run a TI scout to find the exact value that nulls healthy myocardium. Two, mismatched slice positioning. Copy the exact positions from your earlier CINE sequences to ensure you get comparable images. Three, timing mistakes. Have all sequences ready before contrast injection. You can't pause to plan mid-protocol. Four, not enough phases. Use 60 plus phases for perfusion if the heart pumps slowly to capture the full cardiac cycle. And five, contrast safety issues. Always check that the patient's EGFR is above 35 before injection. If you have any questions, just ask them in the comments. I read and answer to every single one. And if you found this video useful, please like it or share it with a friend or colleague. I look forward to seeing you again in our next session.